five minutes. Okay. I will try to be discreet in my timing when to let you know when you're getting to that point, okay? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Thank you, Counselor, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, I'm Jason Mulholland. I represent Wright Insurance Agency, Inc. and Anthony Wright. Those, we are the appellants in this case. This case, this, this is a bad faith, um, third party common law bad faith case. And Mr. Mulholland, has, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you right off the bat. Yes, Cause please. I wanna make sure I understand the chronology here. This lady was in an accident in 2001, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and she filed her lawsuit, her tort suit in 2005. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and it's two, it's 2020 and, and we're still dealing with this case. So yes, she's been waiting 19 years to find out how this is gonna turn out. Yes, yes, ma'am. All right, so in June of 2011, there was the stipulation filed in um, the tort suit, the Cunningham agreement, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then in um, February of 2012 um, and March of 2012, notices of hearing were filed to set a hearing on the stipulation, I suppose. Um, and then finally in April of 2012, the court approved the stipulation. Yes, Your Honor. And I don't see anything in our record that indicates um, who was obligated to get it approved or why the parties included a provision requiring court approval. Is there anything in the record that would explain that? I didn't see anything. Yes, Your Honor. In, in um, the stipulation itself, uh, paragraph 15, in the record sites are record 217 and 220. Um, but th this paragraph is part of the stipulation and it reads, the parties jointly move to court the court to approve the stipulation. Um, okay, but so we don't know why the parties decided to do that. We just know they did. Is that, that right? That's correct. That's, okay. that's what the stipulation All right. reads. All right. So in 20, so in April 2012, the court finally approved it. Yes, ma'am. Your com the complaint, um, the bad faith complaint didn't get filed until May of 2015. Yes, Your Honor. And we don't know why that happened either, do we? There's nothing no. in the record that explains that delay. Right. And I didn't see anything in the stipulation that says when it has to be filed. <clears throat> Is there anything in the stipulation that said when the complaint had to be filed? No, Your Honor. Okay. Um, the stipulation did provide for removal to federal court, which happened, and then the federal court threw, threw it out. So then now we're back in state court. Is that correct? Uh, Your Honor, I'm not sure that the stip, and I'm not challenging. There is a, just, you're going to have to trust me on that. There's a provision in the stipulation that it's going to be removed to the federal court in the middle district. O okay. I think there was Yes, Your Honor, I'll trust. I, I believe that there was a stipulation that said there's nothing that can prevent if jurisdiction lies, there's nothing to prevent. Yeah, yeah. I, well, yeah, obviously they can't confer jurisdiction on the federal court. Yes, ma'am. All right. And then we've gone through a couple of amended complaints and motions to dismiss and finally it was dismissed and here we are. That's correct, ma'am. All right. One of the things I'm curious about, so have I missed anything in the chronology? First of all, no, no, Your Honor. Okay, one of the things I'm curious about, and I think it's argued in Nationwide's brief, is that you have disavowed that this action has anything. It's not an action on the stipulation that this is different than the stipulation. Yet the stipulation says that um, the parties desire to determine whether Nationwide's acted in bad faith by an action bought un brought under the terms of this stipulation. So what am I to, to think when you're saying, no, this doesn't have anything to do with the terms of the stipulation, but the stipulation says, no, you're gonna bring an action pursuant to the terms of the stipulation. 
Your Honor, I believe that the, the passage in the, in the answer brief that you're referencing was an argument that I made to the court prior to us uh, raising the, the disputed terms of the stipulation. So essentially, right. the, the stipulation is, is one thing that it doesn't, it's not evidence in the bad faith case. It's not part of the complaint. It sets right. what happens post determination of whether there's bad faith or not. So the stipulation itself, the amount that's that's been agreed to by the parties, none of that stuff should come before the the uh, the trier of fact. None of that information is supposed to be admitted in the in the bad faith case. Um, but it became an issue when the appellee challenged certain terms of the agreement and that uh, appellants well, I mean, sought. Is I, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but, it, but I think what it boils down to on the statute of limitations is they contend that your bad faith action accrued when everybody signed this and you contend, no, it didn't accrue until the court approved it. Is, is that yes, it? Yes, Your Honor. Well, that's what that's one part of it. The other part is the dispute between what statute of limitations applies, which period, the five-year period and the four-year period. But if we determine whether the five-year period applies or the four-year period applies, if it's the four-year period, that question that Your Honor just asked becomes crucial. Okay. Do I understand Sorry for jumping in and cutting you off, but I wanted to make sure I hadn't missed anything. So go ahead with your argument. You're, you're right on your well, own. Before you go ahead with the argument, the five-year statute arises out of this Baranowski, at least the argument comes out of the federal court, the Baranowski case and the some of the Florida Supreme Court cases that are cited in that opinion. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. But apparently the Baranowski finding of a five-year statute as this matter being a I think it's the term is of contract um, is not the majority view across the country. Is that right? Uh, well, Your Honor, I, I, I think the Baranowski case is interpreting Florida law, and that's what we're seeking to have applied. I understand. Baranowski but but, but we, are, we are not necessarily bound by Baranowski, although it's persuasive to this court, correct? Yes, Your Honor. I'm, I'm not arguing that you're, pers you're, you're bound by that decision. And if we were to determine that that case, or, or at least the holding of that case is determinative, then your, your complaint would be within the statute. Yes, Your Honor. Correct? It would. Okay, I got it. Okay. Um, so the, the two main issues in the appeal concern this, the one, the statute of limitations that applies, whether it's the five year that applies to contracts or whether it's the four year that um, Appley argues applies based on recharacterizing or recategorizing uh, a third party bad faith, common law bad faith claim. Um, the, if the court, if this court determines that the five year statute of limitations applies as we contend it should, uh, it would be in, um, it would be holding, uh, its holding would be amply backed up by support by the Florida Supreme Court in its characterization as these, these claims as um, ex contractu. And that case was Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company versus McNulty. That is also the case that the Baranowski court relied upon and other courts throughout the, the whenever this issue has come up have relied on the McNulty case to, to uh, categorize the bad faith, the nature of a bad faith action such as this. As it's kind a, of a peculiar, uh, almost fall in the crack sort of claim though, because it really isn't a contract claim. Understand that the only reason perhaps it gives birth to a claim like this is the existence of an insurance contract, but it's really more of a negligence claim. Yeah, Your Honor, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna disagree. And, I thought and you I might agree that it that it falls in the cracks, and it has since I've been practicing, since I've become familiar with this area of case law. Um, it does defy uh, de definition in some ways, uh, but I would caution against the uh, the uh, use of or as ascribing it to a, a cause of action in negligence, because the Florida Supreme Court has already cautioned against such a classification, and that case was called grounds. 
and I cited uh, and I described that uh, in my reply brief. In fact, the Florida Supreme Court in grounds accepted jurisdiction just to make that point clear. Um, so when in this case, when we ask that the five year limitation be applied, it's based on the uh, case law describing these common law bad faith ca cases all the way back to 1938, which was a case called Auto Mutual versus Shaw. That was also referenced in my reply brief. Um, the, the case Ms. law Rowland, makes it, but it doesn't matter whether it's four it doesn't i'm sorry it doesn't matter if it's four or five if we were to conclude that you didn't have a bad faith claim until the court approved the stipulation is that correct yeah uh, your honor if the court concludes that the bad faith claim could not be brought until it was until the underlying litigation was resolved by approving that stipulation then it's 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 timely regardless of whether it's four or five years that's we, yeah that's if, what i said it doesn't matter we, what it we, is if we made a holding on that basis we wouldn't even get into this baranowski five-year four-year issue would we that's true your honor that's true the um so if we decide, if we do get into the uh, five, there, there, I'm trying to pick up where I, where I never really started. Um, it's like the good news and the bad news. We're interested in your case, but we're interested in your case. Yes, I appreciate that interest. Um, the, the, the cases that describe why this thing, why the bad faith case wasn't appropriate until, um, the court had taken action on the underlying case. The, the primary case concerning that is called, called Dixie Insurance Company versus Gaffney. And in Dixie Insurance Company versus Gaffney, the court determined that a, the, the, um, a direct action against the insurance company would be inappropriate while the underlying claim was still pending. And so they said, you can't do that. Uh, there was later an exception carved out by the Florida Supreme Court in the Cunningham case. Cunningham. And that is the exception that was utilized in this case. But it doesn't, it doesn't excuse the requirement that, that the underlying case be resolved or completed, or in, in this case, it was agreed that it would be stayed. It, well, it, what, it, what, what, the, what the agreement does is it, it, cre it, it satisfies one of the elements of a bad faith claim. Correct. Yes, Your Honor. It satisfies the the element in in a third party context like this. It satisfies the element that there be an excess, excess right, gain. right. Um, and in in typical cases, as and 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 actually, in your stipulation, you also said that that you agree that the stipulation is for the purpose of determining damages in a contemplated bad faith action as well. So it also at, worked to determine the damages. It, the, the stipulation- which is, all, which is an element of the bad faith claim. Yes, Your Honor, the, the stipulation determined the, the, ele, the damages. And, and, but I, I, our position is that until the court approves it, it would be improper to proceed because there, the, the underlying case would still be pending. Um, the, the confusion- Which is why I was curious which is why I was curious about the, the fact that the stipulation and the parties contemplated court approval. Yeah, yes, Your Honor, that's, that's, I wasn't party to the agreement, uh, so I can't say for sure. That was part of my, one of my counts, but um, I believe that they, that, that, that well, was I went through this point. record pretty carefully. I'm not saying I read every single thing in it, but I went through it pretty carefully. I didn't see a discussion in what I looked at or anything that that um, purported to explain why the parties agreed that there had to be court approval. You know, I, I can I don't think there was anything in there other than that they agreed that that would be that would that that would occur. And then they base right. the performance of those, the performance of the terms of the stipulation, they based on court approval. So nothing was happening right. until the court right. approved it. And then um, as it was noted in the answer brief uh, filed by Appley, Ap Appley, 
by the uh, appellee, um, the, uh, there, there was a contingency provided by the parties in the stipulation that if the court disapproved the stay and disapproved- Right, a judgment would be entered. Then judgment would be entered. And at that time, Dixie versus Gaffney would be satisfied when that, when that judgment was entered. But right. before that, we were in a limbo because they, the parties had an agreement on paper, but the action was still pending. And it, would, uh, it wouldn't withstand a Dixie- the Gaffney uh, analysis, despite its attempts to get into the Cunningham exception. And so the, I think the party's view was that they needed to have the, the underlying case stayed by the court and that if the court disapproved it, they would have, they would, they had already agreed, a judgment would be entered there, there in ripening the bad Let me advise you final. that we have passed 15, but I didn't want to interrupt you. So if you wanted to reserve your rebuttal time, you're now beginning to use it. Unless the court has any more questions on this line, I would like to reserve some time for rebuttal. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Marcus, I believe you are up next, sir. Yes. Thank you, Judge. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Lee Marcus, and I represent Nationwide Mutual Fire Insurance Company. I guess I'll begin by answering a couple of the questions that, that came up. Uh, that you posed, Mr. Mulholland. First and foremost, um, why did the parties ask for uh, approval by the trial? Court? Only if it's in the record, sir, please. Okay. Um, you can point to something in the record. Well, I can point to the agreement itself, which is we needed to turn off the switch on that litigation. The parties had agreed that they are going to now go ahead and resolve the question of bad faith because the Cunningham agreement itself resolved the two elements that were necessary in the underlying case, which are liability and damages. Right. What the Blanchard Invest cases say is that once those two elements are satisfied, a bad faith case is right. And so the Cunningham agreement resolves those two questions. It resolves it conclusively so that even if the court did not approve the agreement, those elements would not change. All liability defenses were waived. Damages were established at a total of $550,000. And so at that Marcus, point, well, but, but there wasn't question an excess judgment. Cunningham. Go ahead, uh, Judge Kelly. I'm, well, I'm sorry. But, but it doesn't satisfy the requirement of an excess judgment. And I'm going to stop talking for a second. Well, actually, Your Honor, it does uh, satisfy the requirement of an excess judgment. In fact, the Cunningham Agreement itself mirrors the language of the Cunningham case, indicating that it is the functional equivalent of a judgment. And so at that point, uh, all Cunningham requires is that there be a judgment or settlement resolving the uh, Yeah, but you have a stipulation that for whatever reason contemplates court approval. And it hadn't yeah. been approved. Yes, and the court approval actually relates to staying the underlying case. Which it's never been case. stayed as far as I can tell, but but regardless. It, it, it has, Your Honor. The, the order that is attached to the second amended complaint as Exhibit 2 is the June 2000, uh, I'm sorry, the April 2012 order of the underlying court staying that proceeding and approving the stipulation. Um, and that was really the purpose of getting the court's approval so that we weren't running concurrently on the underlying case at the same time that we were addressing the bad faith case. Because as, as a lot of the case law indicates, that's a problem when you get into discovery. And so the purpose was, let's throw the switch on the underlying case since there's nothing left to do there. That was the only purpose. As far as who it was that had to go get it, um, as Mr. Mulholland indicated, it says that the parties will do that. You'll note that the style of the case, Nationwide is not a party to that litigation. They do pay the counsel uh, for the defendants, but they are not a party to that litigation. So it was on the parties. You were a party to the stipulation though, weren't you? Yes, we were. Um, but we did not have any standing in the lower court. Uh, Perhaps we could have intervened for the purpose of trying to get it approved. Um, 
but I believe that where the Cunningham agreement references that the parties will get approval, that's indicating the parties to that action. And is, is that me, one I, of the questions we have to answer memory. today? That is whether or not you have a Cunningham agreement. In Cunningham, it appears it says the stipulation is the functional equivalent. And if I would like to follow up what Judge Kelly was trying to drive at, does your stipulation modify what might have been a cutting agreement to require court approval, thereby changing what would otherwise be a Cunningham agreement? It doesn't. There's no modification in terms of the necessity. And in fact, if it requires court approval, then it's not the functional equivalent, right? Well, it is because paragraph 10 of the Cunningham agreement indicates that if there is not approval by the court, that's okay. We're going to enter a judgment. We're going to, at that point, turn the switch off ourselves. The purpose there is we know- Yeah, because then ability. you get a judgment. So what that tells me by including that provision is if you get court approval, you've got the equivalent of a judgment. If you don't get court approval, we're going to enter a judgment. So either way, you get a judgment, well, which you need to have a bad faith claim. Well, the agreement does not say that um, it becomes effective upon court approval. And the court cannot read that language in. What it says is- No, but I can read agreement. the agreement and try to understand what the provisions mean that are there. I mean, that has to have some import. Well, the only import that requesting the stay had was uh, uh, requesting approval was again, to throw, to throw the switch on the underlying case. And so, all the cases require, when you look at the Supreme Court cases of Blanchard and Vest and Cunningham itself, they say that- Are you saying, actual, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you saying Best with a B or Vest? Best, V-E-S-T. Uh, okay, Vest thank versus you. Travelers. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, those cases say that the cause of action for bad faith accrues once there is a determination of liability and damages. It doesn't say obtaining an excess judgment it doesn't say actually having something approved by a court. It says merely that there has to be resolution of the questions of liability and damages, which this stipulation does. Because no matter what the trial court did, whether it approved it or didn't, the liability defenses were waived and the damages were established. And as it relates to the okay, I want to I want to I want to just take a step back to something really basic, because we've been all, all over the place on the stipulation. But looking at their uh, second amended complaint, I think that's the operative complaint that you moved to dismiss. Just looking at the face of that complaint, how do you arrive at your statute of limitations argument just based on the face of the complaint? The Cunningham agreement is attached as exhibit one to the complaint and therefore the date on that agreement is part of the pleading. With the case law that universally holds that a contract is finalized once the fi last party signs, um, that is the date of accrual. Because at that date, we had a contract in place, we had an agreement um, and the liability and damages were finally established. Can you? Go ahead and give me your best argument as to why the four-year statute should be applied as opposed to the five-year as it's t discussed in Baranowski and Grounds and McNulty and the other cases. Certainly. Um, because it's a, it seems like the weight of the Florida authority, perhaps not on point exactly, points us towards the notion that the five-year statute should be, should be applied here. Well, Judge Black, what the case law says is that a bad faith action is ex contractu. It doesn't say anything about a five-year statute. Ex contractu simply means that it is of a contract. Now, the statute of, of limitations has separate provisions for written and unwritten provisions of a contract. Um, the Gulf Life case and the Schrank case, both of which are cited in our brief, indicate that when you have a written contract, but there are unwritten obligations in that contract, things that are implied in law, such as in the, in the Schrank case, it was the issue of contribution, where there was not an express provision in the contract for contribution, but it's implied in law. Well, where you have that, 
you have a four-year statute of limitations for unwritten contracts because the obligations are not expressly contained within the written instrument. And so that is one way that the court can look at this, that even if it is ex contractu, we are not running afoul of the cases that say bad faith is ex contractu. Uh, it's simply a question of written or unwritten obligations. And there is not a single- afoul, But it would be running afoul of what the uh, circuit court said in Bar Baranowski. It would, and, and as, as the court has already um, observed, you are not bound by a federal court opinion. Uh, you merely can consider it as persuasive if it is well-reasoned. The problem with the 11th Circuit's opinion in Baranowski is that it is not well-reasoned. In fact, it relies upon first party uh, breach of contract cases to reach its conclusion. The district court opinion by Judge Whittemore was actually a well-reasoned opinion where he goes back to the roots of what is a bad faith case. A common law bad faith case, according to the Florida Supreme Court, is a case that arises out of implied in law fiduciary obligations. And in fact, the second amended complaint at paragraph 30 expressly indicates that they are seeking relief on obligations that are, that are an operation of law. And so wanna, where do you, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, go ahead and finish your answer, then I have a question. Okay, thank you, Judge Kelly. Um, where you have a cause of action that arises out of fiduciary obligations, and that's really what we're dealing with, because we are not dealing with a contractual term. In fact, by definition, a bad faith claim is extra contractual. The contractual terms set a policy limit, and that policy limit is already resolved, is already agreed to. The question is, is Nationwide responsible for something beyond that policy limit, meaning beyond the contract? And so where that duty arises as a fiduciary obligation implied in law, the statute of limitations, according to Judge Whittemore, would be based upon a breach of fiduciary duty, which is a four-year statute of limitations. And that is where, yes, there is um, concern as to the definition of a bad faith suit as to whether it is ex contractu, whether it's based in tort, whether it's a hybrid. Uh, Judge Black, well, you're correct that the majority of the states consider a bad faith case to either be a tort or a hybrid, not ex contractu. Um, well, I think there's a wrinkle here in this case that I just would like to explore with you on that. Um, the stipulation says that the parties desire to determine the issue of whether Nationwide's acted in bad faith by an action brought under the terms of this stipulation. Okay, yes. we've got that provision. And then we have a provision that says that Wright and the agency will file and prosecute a new and separate lawsuit against Nationwide for declaratory judgment, seeking a judicial determination of what, of whether Nationwide has committed common law bad faith in the handling of claims, et cetera. So, and there's no time. It just says they'll do it. And first, and I, as an aside, I don't know how you're complaining that they filed a deck action when it says file a deck action in the stipulation. But if they're supposed to bring the action pursuant to this stipulation and the stipulation just says file this deck action, it doesn't say when, uh, what, you know, why would this not be an action pursuant to the stipulation, i.e. a contract? Because what the contract because says, without this you wouldn't have a bad faith right well without this we would have had to resolve the liability and damages in the underlying suit by entering into right. this stipulation the parties agreed to bypass that process in order to have right, but I, I i get let me i sort of distracted you i'm i'm a little bit hung up on why this really isn't an action 
pursuant to the stipulation, like it says it would be, it says, hey, you're going to go file a DAC action. Doesn't say when. And so, you know, why, why is this not an action pursuant to the stipulation? Because the action is for bad faith. There's not a cause of action here. For well, it's a deck action conflict. to determine whether you acted in bad faith. Well, there's not a there's not a question here as to whether somebody breached the Cunningham Agreement. This isn't an action on that contract. This is an action where the agreement. The well, no, I understand that, the but but. Yeah, no, I understand that, but it says pursuant to this stipulation, and the stipulation said just says go file this deck action to determine whether there was bad faith. But it doesn't say when. Well, as as an aside, I'll first, I'll first note that if if it is going to be, uh, why do we complain that it's a deck action? Because we can't agree to subject matter jurisdiction is is the answer. That's a short answer. If it is a DEC action, then that's a four-year statute of limitations under Hollywood Lakes and, and several other cases that are cited in our brief. So then we don't even get the four five years years from when? Four wait, four years, four years from when? When the stipulation was signed? Yes. And so But does again, it have to be four years from when there's a dispute? About well, if there is, if they are seeking an interpretation of that document, and in count two, what they've asked for it, which, by the way, count two, yeah, which I not, don't understand it at all, but okay, let me let me back up and try to clarify. Well, no, I, is, I mean I understand what they've said. I don't understand why, because it seems to me that the issue of when the statute of limitations ran is governed by this stipulation. And well, you, you and and. And you answer that in the context of the statute of limitations argument, not by a separate deck action on, on the stipulation. But well, if, if the contract is silent as to when they are going to bring it, if the stipulation is silent as to when they're going to bring the action, they still have to, at that point, comport with the statute of limitations for what is going to be brought, which is a bad faith claim. Okay. So you're correct. Judge Kelly, it does not say when they're supposed to bring it. That simply means they can bring it at any time from the time that their bad faith action accrues until the stipul uh, until the statute of limitations expires okay. on a bad faith claim. Okay. I'm sorry, Judge Casanueva, you're muted. Judge Casanueva, you're I don't muted. know how that happened. Oh well, they're probably wise people trying to keep me quiet. They're very very smart. <laughs> Let me follow up something that is has troubled me, and it's it's kind of a subset of the discussion. If we go to Cunningham and we measure what the language of Cunningham says, that the stipulation is the functional equivalent, and then we look at the stipulation in its entirety, and as you said, it became a contract when the last party signed it. If we decide that that contract, that of stipulation, is more than or less than a Cunningham stipulation, does the statute of limitation then begin to run based on a contract as of the date it was signed, which would be five years? Because I think as you noted, the stipulation is a contract and it says you have a right to bring a cause of action. So it seems that the underpinning of your argument is that we must first conclude that the stipulation is nothing more than a Cunningham agreement. But were the court to reach a conclusion that it was more than a Cunningham agreement, i.e. not just a stipulation, it was some engrafting of other rights and it became a contract, would not then there'd be a five-year term. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm just saying there's a logic flow. I'm not asking you to concede anything. I don't believe the logic flows because again, this is not an action for breach of the Cunningham Agreement. That would be a five-year statute of limitations. But we have a, a claim for bad faith which has a four-year statute of limitations that accrued on the date that liability and damages were established. And that I, I have to keep coming back to whether this is more than or less than a Cunningham agreement. It doesn't matter as long as it conclusively resolves whether there is liability and damages. And those are conclusively resolved by this, uh, by this document. 
Thank you. Now, in terms of the... Um, I should let you know you're about 18 and a half. Uh, okay, well, I guess then um, I just need to wrap up. Well, I just want to make sure you didn't run out of time in the middle of a thought. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the, I guess my parting, uh, my car parting comment is to uh, once again emphasize this is not an action where they are seeking contractual damages. They are seeking something that they are entitled to under the written insurance policy. They are seeking at best an unwritten term, a term that is implied in law, which is a four year statute of limitations under 95.113K and under Gulf Life and Shrank. Um, they are and I understand this is inconsistent with what the Supreme Court has said about ex contractu cases, but they are asking for damages for breach of fiduciary duty. And that is a tort under Florida law. And at the very least, then a bad faith claim would be a hybrid. And perhaps if the Supreme Court considered it in the context of a statute of limitations, they might change their view on whether this is ex contractu or some hybrid. Because where it stands now, if an insurance company, uh, according to the argument uh, that is presented by the appellant, if an insurance company breaches a fiduciary duty, that's a five year statute of limitations. If anybody else, any other company, any other citizen, creates a breach of fiduciary duty, whether it arises out of a contract or not, that is a four-year statute of limitations. And so there's an equal protection concern. Thank you. I think your time has gone by, but I want you to finish that last argument. Thank, Thank you, you counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. May I be heard? Yes, sir. I'm doing the time okay. clock. You know, I have many tasks here. Okay. You, you still have your five left. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, let me just first point out that the um, Blanchard and Vest cases that were referenced or, and cited by uh, Appley, um, those involve first party cases. And it's important to distinguish those cases from the third party common law bad faith case when you're determining whether this, what, what period of statute of limitations applies. Um, in, a, in a first party case, it makes sense that you would have to have both liability determined in, in a first party case. That means that the claim was covered. And, and that the claim, uh, the damages were also identified in a first party case because you wouldn't know whether they exceeded the policy limits or not. So those two things are, are, are in Blanchard and they're essential to a first party situation. The Dixie v. Gaffney, Cunningham type cases that deal with third party exposures and third party common law bad faith, those cases are dependent on when the judgment or its functional equivalent is um, established. And as the court was, was asking about earlier, um, let me just say this about the, um, about the ground, the uh, case being considered, the bad faith, common law, bad faith being considered a uh, tort. Um, the, the cases that, that Appley cites that stand for the proposition that it's a fiduciary duty, those cases all say four year because they identify fiduciary duty as an intentional tort. And the one thing that, that, that the Florida Supreme Court has made clear in the grounds case is that, the, that these cases are not torts. In fact, that in the grounds case, they accepted jurisdiction just to make that point clear. Um, they, and they said specifically, it follows that the cause of action for the excess where one arises from bad faith is bottomed on the contract and the nature of an action thereon is ex contract two rather than in the tort. And uh, secondly, with regard to the Gulf Life uh, cases, the Gulf Life case, the ARDC corporate, uh, corporation cases were cases that said that oral contracts that maybe have evidence uh, contained in writings, those oral contracts have a four-year statute of limitations. The, um, the Schrank case cites to a case that's called Heredita, H-E-R-E-D-I-A, 
And that case is, is perfect for this, for this determination. The determination of whether the contract action is controlled by the statute of limitations for four years for an action on oral contract or the provision of five years for an action on a contract obligation or liability founded on a written contract um, was the exact issue that was determined in Heredia. And they said that case involved a bus ticket that, that gave rise to uh, the, the bus crashed. And they implied, the law implied that that ticket included that the bus would be driven safely. And so the main thrust of, of the Heredia case is um, a written instrument may have written legal effect beyond its actual words, resultant upon its wording and purpose. It must be considered to embody obligations which legally are to be implied from its wording and the relationship the par of the parties. That's exactly what a bad third party bad faith case is. Under Shaw, under Boston Old Colony, the relationship between the insured and his insurance company and the, the uh, relinquishment of their, uh, their opportunity to defend themselves into the insurance company's trust gives rise to these duties that are, the courts say, fiduciary in nature, but they don't define the, the, the duties as fiduciary duties. In, it is loosely said, and in fact, in this case, it was loosely applied. Those are, those are amount to fiduciary duties because of the nature of how they arise, but they don't supplant the characterization of a third party common law bad faith case as one that is grounded in contract. One more thing here. You have about uh, 30 seconds left. Well, I have a, a question that maybe you can answer in 30 seconds or not. At, at some point I sorted through why, I sorted through the, was this a first party or a third party case? Because I know that that's an issue, you know, because of Blanchard, et cetera. And I had resolved that, yeah, it probably is a third party, but I have forgotten how I got to that conclusion. So tell me why you contend it's not a first party case. Yeah. Uh, the case is called McLeod, M-C-L-E-O-D. It, it's a footnote in McLeod. I think it's footnote, footnote two. Um, it describes the, where the benefits are paid to is the easiest way to determine. In a third party case, the benefits are to be paid to the injured claimant, who is a third party to that agreement. In a okay. third party case, the insured themselves receives the benefits of the insurance contract. So it's... it's um, a first party case, they have the relationship and the only availability for a bad faith case in a first party matter is under the statute. So that's why cases that concern like QBE and, and some of the other cases that have been cited by the appellee, they don't, the, the statutory bad faith claim that's only available in first part, first party okay. case doesn't apply in the common law bad faith claim. So- the, Okay, thank you. The case okay. law is consistent. Now, the one last Thank you, thing counsel. I think I need to let you know that we are well past the time. And as I did for the appellee, I will do for you. Time has expired. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you both. Please stay well and stay safe. And you're welcome to, after you exit to stay, if you are interested in remaining our docket. If not, just stay well and have a good